Thank you. We now have the topical questions. Before I call Aileen Smith, can I advise members that legal proceedings are ongoing in relation to the legislative competence of the named persons provisions. The matter is therefore sub judice for the purposes of standing orders, and so members should not refer to the specifics of the case. Eileen Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will review the named person scheme in light of recent reports that the Scottish Public Sector Ombudsman has raised concerns. Minister Eileen Cam. Okay, thank you. The Scottish Public Se Sector Ombudsman has raised a technical concern about the Parliament's general approach to complaints procedures and the process in particular, which relates to the complaints process for parts four and five of the Children and Young Scotland People Scotland Act. As the member will recall, these measures were supported by all groups and passed unanimous, unanimously sorry, at stage three of the Act. This included provision for using the affirmative procedure for the regulations detailing the content of the process, which order was considered by the Education and Culture Committee today. I am not aware of any concerns the Ombudsman has in relation to the named person service, nor the approach taken to the complaints procedure. Indeed, the Ombudsman was clean, keen to emphasise his support in a recent letter, and today's news release makes clear that the letter to committee does not comment on the service itself and is about a minor technical point. On the wider issue, more generally about statutory complaint procedures, the member in her role as Deputy Presiding Officer might be well placed to take this forward, and I'd be happy to discuss matters uh, from the perspective of our, of our recent experience with Liam Smith. Well, I thank the Minister for that response, and I do note that whilst the Ombudsman's concerns are specifically about process, there are wider concerns amongst many constituents who have been contacting me recently. So, for example, I understand the Scottish Government has endorsed a toolkit for councils and teachers to use to structure questions for children and I wonder if the Minister can confirm that first of all and if that's correct tell me what oversight and monitoring the Scottish Government has in place of how this tool is used to ensure that questions are appropriate and responses treated with care and confidentiality. Minister. Um, I'm not aware of the Scottish Government sort of testing, uh, using any sort of test around the name person but if the member has specific issues that she wants to raise with me I'll be happy to uh, speak with her and discuss this uh, in uh, those uh, terms. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank the Minister for that offer, and I will certainly take it up. Um, can I also further ask, though, if any professionals involved in the Name Person Scheme have concerns about how information is being used and would want to report that, will they be protected by whistleblowing legislation? And further, the EIS Union have expressed some concerns over the potential for teachers to be left with increased workloads and be required to work on uh, these additional Holiday, uh, sorry, these additional responsibilities over their holidays. So, has the government taken any steps to quantify the likely impact on teachers' workload? Minister, uh, we've worked with the EIS and a number of different organisations and bodies about the, the legislation. Did that during the process of the bill? Have done that as well through the consultation on guidance, um, and we'll continue to work with anyone. And, and you know that again, that offer is there to continue with that dialogue on the issue of information sharing. Uh, the the fact remains that. This bill, the legislation that we passed in 2014, the Children and Young People Act, provides a robust framework to allow for appropriate proportionate information sharing to happen and provides that in a way that hadn't been there in the, in the past. And for that, I think, will allow us to make sure that that information that is re re relevant around the children's needs and the family is shared with uh, appropriate people in conjunction uh, and in collaboration with the parents and what they to say to that family member. Uh, whether or not they are content with that to happen. So there, there is a robust framework there in place that has been enabled through the passage of the Children and Young People Act. John Mason. Uh, thank you. I mean, I wonder if the Minister uh, would agree that this scheme could be helpful for a vulnerable family in my constituency who are not sure where to go for help, and the named person scheme will make it clearer for them and easier for them to get help. Minister. Uh, I, I, absolutely. The whole thrust of this legislation is to stop what we have been told in the past through various consultation, through the parenting strategy, through the Highland Pathfinder, that what families are fed up doing has been passed from pillar to post, going from service to service, trying to explain time and time again uh, their story. This uh, process, getting it right for every child, the name person as part of that, allows for uh, a coordinated approach to provide families with the, the support that they need at an earlier point in time to avoid them having to uh, escalate their issues into crises and avoid uh, costly or more costly our services being deployed, but far more importantly, avoid that costly uh, intervention in terms of the uh, 
damaging uh, impact that will have to the, to the family if things are left to grow and escalate. This is about early intervention, prevention and helping families when they need it most. The named person will deliver upon that. Uh, and I'm happy again you know, to offer to meet with uh, John Mason around uh, some of the issues that he may have. Well, Smith. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary accept that the greatest degree of concern about the name person policy for parents is the fact that there is this data sharing and whether that's wholly transparent? And would she agree that the concern that the uh, Public Sector uh, Services Ombudsman uh, has raised about the overly regulatory nature of the complaints process could actually extend these concerns because he's flagging up the fact that the Scottish Government is proposing an unwieldy complaint system which is actually at odds with other public sector areas. Minister. As I said in response to uh, Elaine uh, Smith, the, Scot the Children and Young People Act provides a robust framework to allow for that information sharing to happen in a proportionate and appropriate way and so it provides that, uh, that, that reassurance that I think families deserve. Uh, this uh, regulation uh, that I passed today at committee is aligned uh, to other complaints procedures and the, uh, just remind the, the member that during the passage of stage three the amendments that I uh, brought forward uh, taken cognizance of the very valid points that Liz Smith raised at stage two uh, placed a duty and responsibility on Scottish ministers to develop and implement a complaints procedure for parts four and five and set out the issues that we might want to take forward in secondary legislation. And that's exactly what I did uh, today earlier in the committee. And that was what was agreed to due, from all parties during uh, stage uh, three. I would remind uh, the member, though, that the uh, Ombudsman did release a statement and said and reiterated that it was a minor technical issue that he was raising. Uh, you know, and we have worked with the SPSO on a number of occasions during the development of this regulation, which I'm glad was passed uh, earlier today. Um, again, you know, if the member wants to raise anything in particular, he, she should do so. Uh, but I have to say, though, that some of this around what has been a technical and minor uh, issue that the Ombudsman has raised uh, has been uh, used as a tool for more posturing and grandstanding on this issue, which is designed to help families and designed to protect children. Question number two, Liam MacArthur. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on reports that 67% of colleges had committed all of or more than their bursary budget by December 2015. Cabinet Secretary Presiding Officer, we have invested a record level of over £105 million in further education student support this year. That is an increase of 29% in real terms since 2006-07. FE level college students can now receive a non repayable bursary of up to £94.52 per week at the best level anywhere in the UK. Colleges have told the Scottish Funding Council what they need to meet their student support commitments this year, and we shall meet those commitments in full. Liam can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response? NUS Scotland President Bonnie Sandland said this week that college budgets are, quote, overstretched and underfunded with students having no certainty about the funding they might receive. She went on to claim that this is, quote, a disaster for our college students who are some of the most in need. The principal of Edinburgh College told the Education Committee this morning that a lack of financial support for students is a major disincentive and is leading many to drop out very early. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with Vonnie Sandlin and Annette Bruton? And can she tell Parliament how many college students drop out each year and so far this year because of a lack of financial support? Well, it's unfortunate that Mr MacArthur didn't welcome the commitment uh, of this government because when a shortfall in student support arises, uh, we will this year meet it in full, as we have actually done uh, in, in every year. There are broader issues uh, in terms of the future, uh, future changes to the student support, particularly in the FE sector. Uh, I'm very alive uh, to the debate between having an entitlement-based system, uh, as we have in HE, but of course in HE, students repay uh, the financial support they receive while studying. And I'm aware of that versus um, a discretionary system that is non-repayable. Uh, and Mr MacArthur will remember from the discussions uh, this morning at committee that positive destinations uh, and completion rates and retention rates uh, in our sector are improving and increasing uh, under this government. Lee MacArthur. Uh, 
the Cabinet Secretary complains about my lack of welcome for her actions, but I was simply quoting the welcome given by Bonnie Sandlin of NUS Scotland. The Scottish Government only gave colleges half the money they say they needed to meet pressures for bursaries. Ministers have a choice. Liberal Democrats have proposed a penny for education, raising £475 million to transfer uh, education, invest in our college and help those from disadvantaged backgrounds. Rather than cutting 152,000 places and providing inadequate bursary support for students who need it, why won't the Minister act to ensure everyone has the opportunity to gain the skills they need to get on in life? Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, of course this Government is indeed acting to provide uh, students in FE with the uh, support they need. And in fact, the shortfall this year in student support is much smaller than it has been um, in previous years. But as with previous years, uh, we will meet our commitments in full uh, to ensure that there is indeed uh, no uh, shortfall. And it surely has to be welcomed that under this government, uh, there has been a real terms increase uh, in student support. Now, that doesn't mean that there can't be improvements to the student support system. And indeed, uh, the Funding Council has had a review of the system and we took early action uh, at the request of NUS Scotland uh, to deal with the, the, the variance rule uh, whereby some colleges uh, were paying bursaries at 80% uh, of the bursary rate as opposed to 100%. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that as from 2016-17, uh, we will ensure that students uh, receive 100% uh, of the reward uh, that is granted. Question three, Christian Allard. To ask the Scottish Government what its plans are for Scotland to become a good food nation by 2025. Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead. The Scottish Government's vision and priorities for Scotland to become a good food nation by 2025 were set out in the Becoming a Good Food Nation discussion document in June 2014. These included the establishment of the Scottish Food Commission, which published its first interim report last week. And that report sets out a refreshed vision and five clear objectives, each with indicators, so that progress on the journey towards 2025 can be measured. And the Government is working to achieve these in close partnership with stakeholders in the food sector and more widely. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for the answer. As the Cabinet Secretary will know how much I have worked over the years to encourage the people of Scotland to buy and eat Scottish food, as it is the best choice for our environment, our food security, our health, and for the sustainability of our communities. What are the Scottish Government's plans uh, to ensure that major retailers uh, give Scottish consumers a real choice to buy Scottish produce? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I should start off by saying I very well know how much effort uh, Christian Allard has put in over recent years to promote uh, Scottish produce, particularly Scottish seafood. And in terms of our work with the retailers, <laughs> that is an objective we have also been pursuing with a degree of success, it has to be said, over the recent years, given that uh, sourcing of Scottish brands um, across these islands by UK retailers has increased by around a third since 2007. Uh, over and above that, there have been many other initiatives working uh, we spoke clearly with a number of retailers for supplier development programmes so that Scottish suppliers can get more shelf space, not just in Scottish stores but across the UK. We have also got Think Local campaigns uh, and so on that have helped uh, local sourcing uh, across Scotland. Mr Allard. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer, but I was looking for more something practical that we can do in the future. I wrote to many, many uh, uh, major re retailers on, on the dairy product, on the seafood, and making sure, and on the meat, of course, making sure that they, they, they don't only advertise a Scottish produce, but they really put Scottish produce on the shelves. Alex Ferguson. <laughs> Sorry, answer I'll answer it if you like. <laughs> <laughs> Cabinet Secretary, would you like to have a wee shot at answering that question? I'd be more intrigued to hear Alex Ferguson's response, but I'll take my opportunity to give my own response. Uh, just to say that, as I said to uh, Christian Allard in my previous answers, there's a number of initiatives taking place with the retailers, uh, not least in terms of the dairy sector, where I've been trying to persuade the, the UK government to convene a summit 
of the heads of the UK retail and food service sector so we can make specific efforts to get more dairy produce onto Scottish and UK shelves from uh, Scottish producers, particularly given that much of our, our butter uh, and our cheeses are imported from other countries, despite the fact we're producing a lot of that good produce on their own doorstep. And that is something practical I'm still working on, and I hope to the UK government support uh, in the future more than what we've had so far. Alex Ferguson. Not sure whether to give a question or an answer, presiding officer, but I'll go, I'll go with the question. Um, becoming a good food nation is, is, is all well and good and very laudable, as indeed is the success of Scotland's Food and Drink Initiative. But what is the government doing to ensure that the benefits of these laudable policies actually reach the primary producer um, on which they depend? And they, because the primary producers across the board are currently struggling like never before. Cabinet Secretary, have you got an answer this time? Well, I wish I had an answer to that question, it's got to be said, because that is one of the biggest questions facing uh, the future of Scottish uh, producers. And whilst we have seen a phenomenal success taking place in Scotland's food and drink sector, where they've smashed their targets six years early, where exports are up by over 50 per cent since 2007, it is indeed the case, and I agree with Alec Ferguson on this point, that the primary producer has not felt that benefit to the same degree as the rest of the supply chain. That does highlight the fact that the supply chain is dysfunctional to a, to a degree. And whilst it's no one national government that's going to be able to sort that out alone, it's certainly a big question that should face the, 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 the future in terms of policy making across not just this country, but the whole of Europe. And I'd like to see a greater focus at European level in particular on that question. And indeed, the European Commission will shortly be publishing a report on supply chain issues. And I do hope that does flag up some issues that we can pursue here in Scotland and that will be pursued across Europe to help ensure that the, the primary producer gets a fair share of every pound spent uh, on food in this country. Roger Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise on how Food Standards Scotland uh, fit into the vision of a good food nation? Cabinet <coughs> Secretary. Well, it's a fair question given that uh, the first anniversary is approaching the creation of Food Standards Scotland and the new body is already making a real contribution across a whole range of, of activities, particularly on nutrition, labelling uh, and diet. And indeed, there's a unit dealing with food crime uh, as well that's been set up recently, which is one advantage of the, the new body being created uh, in the first place. So the Food Standards Agency, Food Scotland's uh, food Standards Scotland also have observer status in the Food Commission that's now up and running in Scotland as well to ensure their input uh, is taken on board uh, in that body uh, as well as we move uh, on the journey towards becoming a good food nation. <coughs> Thank you. That ends topical questions. Point of order, Lynn Smith. Thank you, President Officer. I wonder if you could confirm that questions by MSPs on the issue of the name, person and the Ombudsman comments are a legitimate part of MSPs holding the government to account and uh, in terms of the Code of Conduct, I trust the Minister meant no discourtesy to MSPs when she referred to political posturing on these issues? The Member is very well aware that the responses from the Government Minister have got nothing to do with me as a presiding officer sitting in the chair. The next item of business is a debate on motion number